Hello, everyone. I'm Laura Washington, and I'm really thrilled to be here for this really important conversation. An honor in particular to be with two women who have a very timely and profound bond. And that is, uh, among many other things, that they work together on the Chicago History Museum exhibit, Remembering Dr. King. Joy Bibbins is Associate Director of Collections and Research Services at the Schoenberg Center for Research in Black Culture in New York City. She brings nearly two decades of leadership and extensive curatorial knowledge. Joy previously served as Chief Curator of the International African American Museum. Welcome, Joy. Hi, everybody. Brittany Hutchinson serves as an Assistant Curator for the Chicago History Museum. She specializes in telling Chicago's diverse stories through the interpretation of material culture and cultural history. She previously engaged in curatorial work at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Welcome, Brittany. Welcome. So this is, uh, as I said, very, very timely. Uh, the, the King exhibit has been up for a couple years now, I believe. And I wanted to start by asking each one of you uh, to, to describe what your role is in, in the curatorial world. What exactly do you do? And how did that play out in this particular exhibit? Now, Joy, I'll kick it off with you. Sure. Um, at the time that the Dr. King exhibition opened, I was the director of curatorial affairs at the Chicago History Museum and had been doing that role for a few years, but um, had been a curator for many more at the History Museum. So my role was to develop the story we wanted to tell um, and choose the objects that we could use, work with the designers and the production team um, to make sure that the content was solid and that this was something that we could actually produce in-house. And so I always see curatorial work as a leadership role, but all, always in collaboration with the many people that make exhibition possible. So um, the role here was to really just flesh out the story, choose the objects, um, choose the images, and then uh, provide, really become a talking head, if you will, for the exhibition once it, it's open and participate in programs and so on and so forth. So that was um, my role for the project. Thank you. Brittany, would talk, could you talk just a bit about what you do as a curator and what your role and work was in this particular exhibit? Sure. So my role as a curator is to tell stories. Um, and to develop content to support stories and to interpret material culture and artifacts and objects to support, again, that main story. My role in this particular exhibition, um, oddly enough, was my very first foray into curatorial work. And um, working with Joy was something that I wanted to do for years. I knew of her work. So being able to participate as a curatorial assistant um, at the time was, was a great, you know, um, just honor for me. Now, this is the Chicago History Museum. Uh, so of course we wanna focus on Chicago and that's what you did with this exhibit. But beyond the fact that we're in Chicago and the museum is here, why was it so important uh, you think for us to talk about King in Chicago? Well, um, we were coming up on in 2018. So this, we started in 2017. Coming up on, it's not an anniversary, but Dr. King had been assassinated in 1968. Uh, we were coming up on 50 years since his assassination. Um, and there were many, obviously, uh, events, programs, exhibitions going on nationally to mark that, um, mark that sad event. And one of the things that uh, occurred to us at the History Museum is that we needed to do something a little bit above and beyond what we typically do is we have this big commemoration at the museum is one of uh, the museum's uh, most highly attended days. And what was necessary, however, in 2018 was really to mark that moment in a little, uh, in, a, in a more impactful way. And so I knew that in the collection there were images of Dr. King, not, not hundreds, but enough to sustain a project and, um, so we worked kind of hard to push having something in the gallery for uh, the King commemorative holiday. 
And one of the things that I thought was important or that we thought was important is really to show King's relationship to Chicago. I mean, obviously Dr. King is a national treasure, has international impact. I, I don't, I think there are very few people who don't know who he is um, and, and the words that he, was, he produced, the action that he did during his lifetime. But Dr. King was also very connected to local um, politics and local histories throughout the United States and Chicago was one of those places. And um, one of the things that we wanted to do with this exhibition is, is bring King home to Chicago in the sense that um, Chicago is really the place that King chose to articulate um, or bring evidence of Northern racism against Black people in the ways in which Black people, um, uh, Black people's oppression extended beyond the South. And that, that in other places, that racism looked different. And um, so it's important to know that Dr. King was here to speak out against that racism, but it's also one of the things we wanted to show is that Dr. King was invited, right? So Dr. King has a national reputation, um, but there was leadership here in Chicago that was pushing against uh, some very hard lines of segregation, uh, mainly residential, but also political, educational, and um, he was right. The, the, the yeah. mayor, Mayor Daly, and many other powerful leaders in the city didn't want him here and didn't want to see that work succeed. Right. Right. And and not they didn't want him here for the same reasons that you will also often hear uh, Southern leadership speak about Dr. King and um, agitators. Um, the, that the problem is local. And we didn't want him here to uh, expose our dirty laundry, ultimately. Um, but I think what the work of Dr. King continues to show me, at least, is that the, the problem is never just local. Mm. It is, um, there are many dots to connect both across the nation, but around the world. And so bringing uh, the Black metropolis issue the Black metropolis's racial issues to life were um, was something really important that I think we all thought needed to be interpreted. Um, and also, you know, again, just this connection. Dr. King started coming here in the 1950s. He came mm -hmm. often. He preached at churches. Um, so there was a there was a very, um, if not intimate, a very close relationship that he had to the city. It's interesting because you, you talk about the, the fact that the city powers didn't want to, to have their dirty laundry exposed and you make a, that connection between the North and the South. Uh, there were some myths that he was that he was dangerously uh, close to exploding about the North being so much more welcoming, being much more amenable and, 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 and better for Black people. And that, that, that was not, that was really a fallacy and part of the King's visit here and part of what happened here expose that fallacy in a way. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Uh, Brittany, what's your, what's your take on the Chicago connection and, and, and what thoughts, what did you, you're, I think you have roots here in Chicago, so it must have been an interesting experience for you uh, to curate that exhibit from that perspective. What are your thoughts on this? So coming in as a, you know, a curatorial assistant, you know, a lot of the sort of base research that I did um, for and alongside Joy was sort of my introduction to Chicago as you know a center or a hub of the civil rights movement. I mean, you know a little bit, but you don't know quite the every you know, every nook and cranny of, of what happened. So having that sort of journey and learning about Dr. King from a lens as a Chicagoan was interesting to me because it made the civil rights movement somewhat personal in that it's not something that happened in a, a faraway land and Chicago was at the center of a lot of the work that needs to be done. So I think in, in understanding exactly what, you know, Dr. King set out to do here and that Northern racism was so different than, than what we were used to understanding racism looks like and um, putting that on the wall, putting that in exhibition and seeing that on paper and on pages was, was kind of um, an awakening, I think. And um, one of the things that it came about, there's a recurring theme is that 
the politicians he was up against here, they made it very clear that their outward image was to be maintained. So the violence against protesters, against Dr. King himself was, wasn't uh, allowed on the scale that it was in the South, but behind closed doors, those insidious you know, movements and maneuvers to keep people oppressed, to keep African-Americans in a, a state of uh, turmoil and, 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 and slums was active and, and mm. um, robust, I think, so. Can, can you share an example that you, of, of a historical example you learned from your work with the exhibit? Sure, so uh, one of the things that happened during the, the Chicago campaign um, was that finally uh, Mayor Daley agreed to sit down with Dr. King and they gathered in a room at a, I think it was a, oh, Saint, oh, I'm gonna forget the name of the church, um, St. James Cathedral Church, a uh, cathedral, I'm sorry, in Chicago. And these promises were made, you know, hands were being taken. And once King left the city, you know, Mayor Daley famously referred to as the promises he made as a gentleman's agreement, right? So the the lip service that was granted to King and his supporters and, and his, his colleagues was, you know, it's unbelievable how blatantly, you know, people willing to lie to Dr. King, um, just to keep people oppressed and keep people um, under the thumb and in slums and in, in, in destitute situations. Interesting. Now, one of the things we do when we, when we try to do when we examine history is to make a connection between the past and the present and uh, to draw a line between the past and the present. And I think one of the things that maybe some people don't realize is that King is viewed diff very differently now today than he was back in 1968, back during the time when he was, when he was so prominent and dominant in the country. Could you, could, Joy, could you talk, talk about that? What's the, how is the King viewed today and how is that different from how he was viewed back in the day? Sure, um, I, I thought about this a, a good deal um, before our conversation here and uh, so at the time of Dr. King's assassination, he was really thought to be quite dangerous, um, very uh, quite radical um, in his in in what he was speaking about, in the connections he was making, um, in his attempts, in some ways, I think, to break out of this binary of black versus white, um, or or these are black people's problems and these are other people's problems. Um, and I think today we view him as obviously heroic. He's iconic. He has a monument, the only non kind of singular non-presidential monument in Washington DC, which I think speaks to his, um, mm -hmm. his significance to the nation. Um, but that comes at the cost of really uh, denying his, his more radical views about capitalism, about violence, uh, imperial violence, ultimately about the violence of the Vietnam War, his objection to the Vietnam War, which he finally made, um, he articulated in 1967, his um, insistence that poverty was ultimately the, the kind of key connector in um, American people's experiences, white, black, Latinx. I mean, that wasn't what they said in, in the 60s, but across these different um, ethnic groups. And um, that those are things that I think are flattened in our mm -hmm. memory of Dr. King. Um, in many ways, what we choose to remember is that dream he spoke about in 1963. And even I would argue that that the whole idea of, of, of mystical visions is radical, but the way that it's is spoken of is 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 very uh, devoid of I think the power that he was pushing towards in um, the late, particularly in the latter part of his um, his career, he was seen as dangerous. Mm -hmm. We don't see him as dangerous today. We don't see his ideas as dangerous today. But I would argue that the notion of um, love and justice are dangerous ideas when they are, when they are 
put to a challenge when they're challenging status quo. And so um, Dr. King was at, um, he was evolving as a thinker. He was in, evolving as an activism, a activist. I mean, he saw what the younger folks were doing. Um, mm -hmm. They were not asking for seats at the table. They were asking for power. Um, and I think that ultimately the way that we think of him now is, is very easy. We don't want to wrestle with the complexity of, um, of his legacy or where he landed in his thoughts about racial justice. Yeah, that, that's that's interesting. And it's true, I think, too, Brittany, and a couple of things I wanted to ask you to reflect on or anything else based on what you just heard. Um, this whole idea that that you know that he accomplished so much and that he Civil Rights Act, all these other great things that he, that he brought about, but yet we still have a lot of work to do. And and is is there a contradiction there? And then also uh, the idea that King is, as is, is, is Joy talks about, King is kind of flattened. We think about him as in these sound bites, and I have, have a dream speech, and these very simplistic, you know, ways of, of, of looking at his history. And and that's that, that's not who he is, and that's not what he represents. So just if you could comment on that in any way you see, you see fit. Sure, I, I absolutely agree. I think that King's legacy unfortunately went through this sort of stripping of the ideals that he held and he fought for. We don't think of him as a, a fighter when people are, are quoting I Have a Dream or using his name to support whatever um, they are wanting to have, you know, this icon support. So this, this change where we have these, you know, pieces of legislation that are coming about because of Dr. King's work and how things still quite aren't, aren't where they could be um, I think that's part of that flattening of, of who he was in the work that he did. I think that's part of that um, wanting to, to maintain the status quo in spite of his work, right? If we, if we diminish his power, if we diminish how radical he was, if we diminish you know, just how hard he fought, then we don't have to really be accountable for the, the fairs as a society that we've engaged in and, and not um, following through with with what we you know could have done, mm -hmm. and I think that for Dr. King's legacy now and and how he's you know treated or regarded is is very much without teeth, so to speak. Um, it's 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 not powerless, but it's certainly not powerful, right? And mm -hmm. so thinking of who he was and how dangerous he was to the point where the FBI was you know, profiling him and following him around to that level, there's a disconnect that happened somewhere. And um, I, I think that for this exhibition and, and many other projects like it, where we wanted to talk about just how connected he was to people and just how much he did and to remember him not for a soundbite, right? To remember him for the work Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that that's what Joy's intention was, and um, you know, I, I followed along with what her 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 goals were. And luckily, and obviously, they were very much in line with with honoring his his work and his legacy in the reality of it. Absolutely. And just to um, piggyback off something that Brittany said, I think that removing the teeth, if you will, of Dr. King's legacy uh, has the is dangerous in that it makes us forget that he was murdered. Mm -hmm. He didn't die. There's a cost um, to, to speaking out. There's a cost to um, fighting for justice. And I think what gets lost is not just his legacy, but the price of the ticket, if you will. Um, and not just the price that he paid, but all of his, co his colleagues, his comrades, if you, were, if you will. Um, who were repeatedly beaten, repeatedly in jail. You know, all of these things that um, violence, um, their connection to the criminal justice system, I think it, it is a disservice to him because it, it definitely um, diminishes the cost that he paid, the price he paid. 
this is a service to him and to all of us because mm -hmm. because we he paid that price for, for us and for our our freedom and dignity. And it's interesting you bring that up in the in, in context of what we are seeing right now in this, our country. But there's so much violence, not just what happened in, in the Capitol recently, but uh, what's what happened uh, over the summer in terms of the street port protests, in terms of what's happening with police brutality. Uh, so. It, is that is 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 is, is there, are there lessons to learn from that sort of overshadowing? I mean, King was a nonviolent man, but he died a violent death, and we 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 want to, as you point out, we want to forget that. What uh, what are the lessons that we should be thinking about today as we as we grapple with the, the violence we see we're seeing in, on the streets of our country right now? Either one of you. Yeah, yeah, I think um, that many of us uh, take inspiration from King's nonviolence. And there is, um, and, and rightfully so, I think that um, he, his argument for peace was that peace is very much connect, connected to justice, right? And justice is is hard is hard one. Um, and I was as things unfolded during the week, um, unbelievably so. It kind of isn't unbelievable, is it? it's not really that unbelievable, right? Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that he was arguing is that violence begets violence. And and here we we are violent people. The United States has has um violently tried to halt people who who march for peace, march for social justice, march for their rights, stand up for their rights. I mean, I think his life is a testament to that. And unfortunately, there are parallels that are going on uh, currently, contemporarily. I mean, think of what happened to the men and women who, um, who violated these civil rights activists, nothing, right? Yeah. We watched them on television beat people, um, uh, violently with the protection of the police. And so when you see what happened on Tuesday, it was it Tuesday or Wednesday, Wednesday. Last, um, last week, yes. Last it, seems week. Like, it seems like a century ago. <laughs> it seems like a long time ago, but I think one of the things that I find most uh, helpful with history is that it helps you to not be surprised, right? Because you, you find in the past parallels to the present. And those parallels help you to ha have a greater understanding of what is happening contemporarily. Um, and so I think there are a lot of lessons that can be learned um, from Dr. King, from Dr. King's uh, colleagues, from the large community that surrounded and supported his work. Brittany, your thoughts? You know, I, I Joy said so many great things. <laughs> Um, I, you know, I think that that's, you know, a really good point that, that Joy mentioned is that, you know, we are a violent people in, in a country that, you know, began at its inception with violence against indigenous communities, against indigenous populations, against, you know, um, those who are enslaved, you know, so on and so forth. That's the history of the United States. And what I think it, it says, you know, even in, in reference to, to this exhibition in Dr. King is that violence is is a tool that is reserved for some right and for those it's not reserved for are they're commonly referred to as the violent ones so we we think of you know as black women our any expression of emotion can be misconstrued as aggression or violence as as african americans as as any person of color or otherwise marginalize our existence is a danger however the entire history of this country uh, in reference to and the treatment of marginalized identities has been violent toward us and not the other way around. So in, in seeing you know, recent events last week and how these individuals are piecemeal being selected for, for some sort of minor punishment, the overarching issue is that, well, for if we're thinking of you know, King and, and his memory in, in this exhibition and, and to commemorate his life, um, every year that if, if we were to 
conceptualize Dr. King appropriately, if you would remember him appropriately, I don't know that we would be at a place currently where some people engaging in violent acts would be acceptable. Mm -hmm. I think if, if we were to remember exactly that he did die a violent death, um, a peaceful man who died a violent death, and that that violence was a call or a, a product of white supremacy, a product of the need to oppress and to silence and to keep people in a place at which they truly don't belong, um, we're not surprised at, at the current events. And truly, I think the only way to address how to correct something, you know, of that magnitude is is to, to, to make an example that this is not who we want to be as a, as a country. And I think Dr. King lived in that path, lived on, on, that, on those principles. That's not who we wanna be as a country. We don't wanna be a country of violence or of inequity or inequality. And as Joy said, that's dangerous. It's dangerous when the fabric of, of any union is built on the backs and built in with the blood of, of others. Um, and, and through violence that the removal of violence as an option, it becomes terrifying to some. So I, I think it's in line with what we're seeing now and, and you know, um, the murder of Dr. King is very much on brand for, for how this country unfortunately works. And All these years later, you know, half a century later, that's powerful. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the exhibit itself. Uh, you both worked very hard on this. You didn't have a lot of time to, to pull it together. Uh, how did you go about deciding how, how, to, how to bring this to, to Chicago, to bring this exhibit to Chicago? And you, you, it's, it's, most of it is, a, is, is based around objects, artifacts, uh, pieces, things, things that you collected or that were in the collection. So, so Joy, I'll start with you. How, how did you talk? How did you think about putting this together, and how did it how did it unfold? And if you could maybe both of you give a couple of examples of things, objects that are in the exhibit that are of interest. Sure. Um, so one, we had a very short amount of time, um, and uh, as an exhibition developer, you have a short amount of time. There are you have some options but you don't have the same amount of options as if you had started two to three years um, before. We also had the, um, the limitations of our collection. We have images, we had um, some materials located in other, other people's collections. Um, I think I mentioned um, Mahalia Jackson earlier. Um, I had known about Dr. King's uh, involvement with Ebony Magazine because of a previous exhibition. So it was oh, really kind of- What was that, his involvement with Ebony? He had a, um, a column in Ebony in um, the 1950s. I believe it was 1957 when he, when he really started in earnest. It was short-lived, um, but nevertheless, it, was, uh, it, was, uh, it showed a bit of his personality. And I know that uh, Brittany read many of those uh, it was kind of like writing Dr. King, ask him a question. He responds to your question. Very interesting, right? Um, and I knew that we had those ebonies in the collection and we could show that. Um, we could at least really show an example of that. We had a letter uh, that he wrote to Mahalia Jackson, a Chicagoan, um, who, well, from Louisiana, but lived in Chicago much of her life um, and very much involved in uh, helping with work of the uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference. So we had that letter. Um, we were able to borrow a few other things to really kind of uh, give it a little bit more um, nuance. Mm -hmm. And then we had images in our collection. Um, so we, we did a couple of different things. We had images, we had um, like newspaper headlines that we blew up to show what, what was going on, where King was. Uh, he was in Soldier Field in 1964. He did another uh, address in 1966. So we were trying to like trace him through the city. Um, and we also used his words um, because Dr. King, you talk about someone who is prolific in terms of uh, he, in some, some days he gave numerous sermons. Let's just say that. 
So, and had a very um, uh, robust kind of archive to draw from himself. So we wanted to bring his words, the images, uh, images from Chicago, images of Chicagoans um, to life. We had some beautiful photographs that um, were, that we borrowed from uh, a local uh, resident. And then we also had some wonderful images in the collection that hadn't been seen yet. Um, color images that we were able to show of his, um, his funeral in Atlanta. So we were really trying to bring together a lot of different things to give kind of an overview. And ultimately it was um, kind of 1957 through the end of his life. Mm. Um, but uh, Brittany composed this wonderful timeline uh, that I think introduced some information that maybe everybody didn't know. Uh, and so we, we really wanted to, we pulled out kind of all the different exhibition development tools, if you will, mm -hmm. um, to make something happen in a short amount of time uh, because it was important. Uh, it's important to, to celebrate and to remember uh, people who've had such a, a, a strong impact locally, nationally, internationally, and we have the, the resources to do so. So that's what we did. That's it's so important that you were able to expand and, 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 and delineate the, the breadth of his experience here. It wasn't just one visit or two visits. He was in and out. As you mentioned earlier, he had an, an almost intimate relationship with the city. And I think a lot of people just were really not aware of that. Um, mm -hmm. Brittany, sounds, Brittany, sounds like you were had to be a bit of an investigative reporter digging up these, <laughs> this information that we didn't know about uh, for that timeline. Um, could you talk about your work and if, are there particular objects that, or materials that you found really compelling? And is there anything that surprised you uh, in terms of the work you did on the exhibit? Sure. Um, so a lot of what we were up against, you know, within that time crunch was that, you know, when you want to use objects to tell a story. You can't quite get them in in the, the speed at which you would want to. We were, were faced with how to um, add depth to the exhibition because we had lots of photos and we did have some objects. And so that timeline, I think, did some of that work of not just mm -hmm. so focusing on King in Chicago, but gave a full account of what was happening in the United States and in Dr. King's life as your sort of um, wrapped around the, the inner uh, section of the of the exhibition that was about Chicago specifically. So using those tools to sort of uh, arrange the material and the information was was one thing that we did. But for me, um, and, and all the research that I was, was happy to do, I think finding color images of Dr. King in Chicago, um, they were outside of our collection and there was um, a photographer, Bernard Kleiner, who was gracious enough to, to loan us those images so we can use them. Um, and he's, he's somewhat, uh, I wanna say famous or very familiar within sort of the museum world for being very mm -hmm. gracious in loaning his photos. Um, they took of Dr. King. And having those in the center of the exhibition next to black and white photos, I think for some people and, and myself included, the realization that, you know, when you see a black and white photo, you think it's it's really, really old, right? But mm -hmm. seeing a color photo of someone who is larger than life and sort of outside of the realm of, you know, the understanding of a normal human being and seeing that they were in your city marching and, and the sweat beads and the texture of the skin was, I think, remarkable and impactful in that way that this is a, you know, um, a, a remarkable, experience to work on this exhibition and to see Dr. King in that way and in, in, in that light um, and in color photos. Um, Can you, also, could you, give, could you just to describe, just to describe one, some of the photos or one or two of the photos that really hit you? So the one that I always think of is um, Dr. King and they're, they're marching, but it's a close-up shot of him and then Coretta Scott King standing next to him. And she's got these sunglasses on with like kind of the cat eye shape and they're, they're marching outside and her hair is perfectly done. And they just, they look like, you know, any couple, but you know that these are extraordinary human beings, both of them in their own right, who are in the city of Chicago to fight 
on behalf of, of African Americans and everyone who's experiencing poverty. Um, and to see them in that way wasn't, you know, I don't want to use the term humanizing because they were already human, but it was just this realization that that people who could be this impactful, right, who saw the city of Chicago and this, the people who lived in Chicago as worthy of this work and they devoted themselves to this work. They moved to 1550 Hamlin and on the West Side to live in a slum to highlight what people were going to through that type of connection to other human beings is something that you can't just reach when you read about them. You have to see them, you have to understand and, and, and know them in that way. And those color photographs, I think did that for me. And even hearing guests come in and talk about, they'd never seen the photo, they never realized how stylish Coretta Scott King was and that she was right next to him um, during a lot of these times you know, for me, I think brought home the, the, the fact that what we were doing with this exhibition and what we do as museum professionals and curators is so important because history can seem so distant. It can, can seem so far away if you don't get close up to it, if you don't have the opportunity to get close up to it. And that being both, you know, African-American women, our lens is specific not only to our training as, as historians and as museum professionals, but to our experiences that we, we live through every day. Um, the historiography that we engage in and how history is written, how it's recorded and how it's shared looks different to us. When you remove the lens of the dominant factors, factions of society and you listen to the voices and you, you see the perspectives of those who have been occluded or pushed aside, history looks different and it feels different. And I think that this exhibition for me was that that confirmation that not only was I, you know, in the right hands and, and working with joy and sort of learning under her, but that this was the the place to have that 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 sharing of history that could be, you know, how do we combat the flattening of a Dr. King? How do we fight the the whitewashing of history? Is that we we engage and we make it human, we make it tangible. And I think that um, for me, those color photos did that. That's fabulous because you you segue right into what one another thing I want to ask both of you about, and that's your role as black women who are also happen to be curators and how you see that. And I think you started to answer that that question a little bit just just now in terms of the special perspective you bring. And I'd like to Joy, I'd, I'd like to get ask you to reflect on that as well as a black woman. How do you see your role as a curator? What 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 what? How does how do your personal experiences impact the work you do? And why is the work of a black, black woman in this field so important? How is it, and if so, how is it different? Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll start with the, uh, my experiences, my life experiences um, first. So I'm a Chicagoan, I'm a South Sider, uh, and I have heard tell, heard tell of stories of Dr. King being in, in the city of Chicago um, at Marquette Park, which is on the southwest side of the city, being assaulted in that park and um, knowing that that is a park that I spent a good deal of my, my childhood playing in, um, being around people there and uh, because of his work that that is in some part possible, but also, you know, kind of walking the streets that he walked. And so the again, it becomes a, a way of making the, the local significant, but also looking at your city through new eyes. And I think that history has that, um, that power. In terms of um, being a Black woman doing this work, uh, and I've, I've done it at the History Museum in places that are uh, that specifically tell the stories of people of African descent. And I think in both instances, it's, it's, it's significant to demystify um, these places for me, right? So we see these cultural institutions, these bastions of, of knowledge and learning, um, and often our stories are not necessarily reflected, but they can be, right? It, it, it requires uh, movement on the part of, of uh, leadership to bring people into the fold. It requires people who are, 
who have who are already there to make a way for younger people to to be part to participate. Um, and what I what I think of as my role now, as I'm getting older in this field, is to do that. Right, is to make a way for people who want to do this work to be able to do this work. The other part of that is um, to make the stories of Black people the stories of people. Right, mm -hmm. we're not magic. We're not we're not <laughs> mystical. Uh, we we have a history, we have cultures, we, we have stories, and they deserve to be told along with all the rest of the stories. Um, and in many ways, because of the ways in which we've had to claw and fight our way into the um, American narrative, there's something unique to share um, and something inspiring to, um, to provide to our audiences. And I, I, that is what I want to bring, like, uh, we're, th this is not history that should be put on a box in a box or on a, on a shelf. You should know this history just like I have to know what what your people did as well, right? And um, and it's also it, it's it's powerful to be able to to communicate in that way. Um, and so the the more that we can share and bring in as many voices as possible. I think the better our understanding of the past is, right? Because um, there is a, a level at which all of our stories are connected, but there is also these places at which there's divergences and um, difference because of the ways in which um, we've experienced the United States, we've experienced Chicago, um, and that needs to be part of the ways it, that the more you know the better informed you are. And again, as I said, I think the less surprised you are when things happen and um, you are equipped with kind of the, that historical knowledge of not just your folks, but other folks as well. Mm -hmm. Brittany, what is anything you would like to add on that in terms of your how you see your mission as a curator and, and, and particularly around this, this particular exhibit? Um, yeah, I think that again, this is I, I will always remember this as my my first step into curatorial practice. Um, so coming into the exhibition and I, you know, I finally landed this opportunity to to work in the curatorial realm with someone I, you know, I was aware of, like sort of secretly like fangirling constantly. <laughs> um, I think for me, like coming in as a as a new person in curatorial work. I felt one, the, the drive to sort of prove that I can do this work, but sort of more importantly, I felt that it was not only my obligation to continue to add stories to this industry um, because they need to be there, but I had to sort of honor those before me like Joy who paved that way. So I had to come in and, and do work for real. I couldn't slack I couldn't you know I can't anyway and we, we know that we can anyway but I think that that was you know even I was even more driven to to show up and show out so to speak mm -hmm. <laughs> we have to I mean, we have to as as you know intersectional minorities and I had to to honor someone who opened the door for me I had to make sure that she had a good reason to open the door <laughs> and to continue to open the door so that I can open the door for someone else and I think this is the you know the perfect exhibition for that because it wasn't overwhelming and I had a lot of autonomy and um, the subject matter I was familiar and comfortable with, but I also learned a great deal that I you know even as someone in the museum industry and with the, with the appropriate degrees hadn't known, so it was you know impactful for me in that way. So as we celebrate. The today, the day of the, the official King's birthday, another one of those things that sort of flattens out his, his legacy. We have a day and then we move on, but we don't want to do that. A uh, parting, uh, parting thought from each one of you about what we, one thing you want people to remember this day, uh, going to, in something, that, a thought and a, or words of wisdom that they should take going forward that, that relates to the legacy of King. Joy? Well, um, one of my favorite uh, King clips, obviously, you know, he, he is perfect 
for media in many ways. That's another story for another day. Um, is a speech he gave to a high school in Philadelphia where, you know, it's, it's pretty famous. If you can't walk, crawl, if you, you know, if you can't, you know, basically do what you can, right? You have an obligation to do what you can, but whatever you do, keep moving. And I think um, that whole idea of looking forward and keeping move, keep to keep moving forward, to keep on keeping on in the um, vernacular of the church um, is something that I think we should all take away uh, from Dr. King. He was tireless in so many ways, um, working always on the behalf of other people, um, strengthening his gift in the process because he, he definitely is a man of, of great gifts. And um, I think that that is what we are called to do um, to help others and in the process, we build our own reserves. Um, and so I think if you are gonna do anything uh, to, to remember Dr. King on, on that holiday, obviously their service, but also look at his words and look at what he wrote and look at how he engaged um, the idea of social justice because it was ever evolving. Um, and I think that that is part of that whole keep moving, right? Keep growing. Um, it's not just about the seat at the, at the Woolworths counter, right? It turned out to be about so much more. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's his gift to us. Brittany, you get the final word. What is your parting word on, the, on this King Day? Um, I, have a, I have a different speech in, in mind when I think of Dr. King and it's, well, to paraphrase it, essentially, you know, why should we wait comes to mind. And it, it's applicable in so many circumstances and especially we're you know, seeing now in, in our country and in our world, waiting for our turn to feel equal and to have freedom, you know, why would we wait for it? You know, take the initiative. If, if we are living in this moment and we need equity and equality now, why would we wait for it? You know, who's to say it's not our turn to feel what it's like to, to be free in the United States, right? The land of the free. There is no, no honor in delaying your own freedom. There's no honor in denying your own humanity and you shouldn't have to wait for it. So for, for those of us who want to do something or, or feel or, or engage in something different or you know, elevated on this King holiday, I think that we should take, take the initiative to, to be the people to make that change happen, to initiate that change and don't wait for someone else to give us permission to be better people, to be better to each other and to, to hold others accountable for insisting that we wait um, for something that should be granted to us all automatically. Now that's a word. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a word or two. Brittany Hutchinson, Joy Bivens, thank you so much for the important and powerful work you do and keep on keeping on. Thank you. Thank you. You too. <laughs> Thank you.